So as I mentioned before, oh, here, Gordon, would you pass these out? Some of you may have caught this. Would you pass these out? Uh, there was a, and I have many more if you run, if you run short. This was from an, a Yahoo list I came upon that talked about the most influential books of the past decade. And they chose one book for each year starting in 2004. And the books are, some of them are just like life books, uh, but almost all of them have some sort of an application to business, to employment, and so forth. So I bought them all. And uh, the only one that I was not able to buy locally was the one about don't work for an asshole or something like that. <laughs> Let me see. No asshole, the no asshole rule. This was the 2007 book. And, um, and, and it comes, I can't wait to get it. Uh, I'm going to have to order it online. It comes with a test that you can see if you yourself might be an asshole. Uh, Yes, they call it ARS. Oh, yes, the test is called ARS. It's the acronym. It's called ARS. It's, it's, the whole thing sounds like such a hoot. I can't wait. So I just, I've got all these books are stacked up in my living room, and I decided I'm just going to, every time I make a presentation, it's going to be on a different book. And so the top of the pile was The Right Brain by Daniel Pink. Daniel Pink uh, has got a lot of really good TED Talks, and some of you may remember... There is a TED Talk that's one of the top 10 TED Talks in, in all the world. And we used it, I think, in, in Launchpad. I, I know I used it in my little job club. But it's a fascinating uh, TED Talk about a, a woman who was a, a, a neurologist who studied strokes for a living, and she had a stroke. And, uh, and in the TED Talk, she talks about what that, what, how that happened. And when she realized she was having a stroke, she thought, you know, the, the left brain of her thought, this is great. This is research. This is what I study. And now I'm going through it myself. And most, and my mother had recently died of a stroke. So I was just riveted to this about what is, what was this like? How did it, how does it feel? And they always tell you that if, if somebody is having a stroke, within minutes, they have to get a shot. And the, the quicker they get that shot, the greater their chances for survival are and for, for um, uh, a, a sort of a diminishment of you know, not, not such a severe uh, impairment. She talked about trying to call work and tell them that she was having a stroke. And those of you who've seen this, help me with this a little bit. She uh, couldn't remember the number. So there's some information that's in the left side of your brain, and there's some information that's in the right side of your brain. And really, we don't function well unless both of those things are working. And they kind of toggle back and forth so that, uh, and I can't remember the details, the, um, like the, the dialing piece was, was, let's say, the right brain, um, and the number piece was the left brain. So she, would, she couldn't find the card, the business card, for her work. She finally found it, and she would dial numbers, and then, and then there'd be a surge of blood that would go from one side to the other. And then when, when the blood would surge, then that part of the brain wouldn't work. And then she would have to wait till it subsided. So she couldn't remember if she had what she had dialed. And it was it was a fascinating study of watching the brain, the different sides of the brain working. And and it was years of of therapy for her to to recover from this. And and so at any rate, it's fascinating. And you can go into TED.com and just put in stroke and it'll come up. Uh, but I hope that you'll all watch that because it's, it's, it's totally uh, concerned with what we're talking about now and a fascinating study of, of the different sides of your brain. So, um, so anyway, the right brain. Uh, one of the things that it said in the book that I thought is applicable to everything in life and everybody that you know, it said the secret to understanding everything and every person, know how it works or know how he works, know how she works, know how they operate, so you know how to work it. Know how things work, so you know how to work it. And part of this is know how your brain works, 
so then you know how to work it. Know how the, the big picture, know how the economy works, so you know how to work it. Know how, how employment works, so you know how to work it. You know how to be where you need to be with the skills you need ahead of time. Understand the dynamics of, of, of the individual, the microcosm. Understand the dynamics of, of the greater world, so that you know how to be successful in it. And I just thought that was, somebody needs to needlepoint that. I thought that was great. <clears throat> All right, your brain, what a cool thing. A hundred billion cells, a hundred billion cells. Uh, the left brain, and I'm sure all of you know this already, tends to be sequential. Uh, it is uh, reading, it's writing, it's things that follow in a logical sequence. Uh, talking, uh, the adjective, the noun, the verb, the adverb, we, we do things in sequence and all of those things about speech are handled in the left brain. Uh, details, analysis, that's the part that's all handled by the left brain. The right brain, uh, Woody Allen considers it his second favorite organ. Uh, the right brain uh, <clears throat> is not like that, it's simultaneous. So if you think about uh, point A, point B, point B, point C, point D, and so forth, that's the left brain. The right brain is like, Chung! I can go anywhere. I can, I can look everywhere, I can, I can be anything. It's simultaneous. It's, it's not one after another. Uh, right brain, the right brain sees the big picture. The right brain sees the context to the details. The right brain is where your emotions lie. Uh, so there's that piece as well. Uh, they found a connection between babies and Arabic. Okay, let me explain. I thought this was so fascinating. They said, uh, move your head from left to right. Move your head from left to right. That's your left brain operating. When you do things from left to right, you're using your left brain. What do we all do from left to right? We read. We read, we write, left to right. Uh, and uh, when you move your head from right to left, you're using your right brain. And, uh, and uh, all the English uh, speakers and the Romance languages and all of those, we go left to right. There are a number of languages that are read from right to left. Pre predominantly Arabic and Hebrew. And those languages are not sequential. Those languages are contextual. And it's said there, um, uh, if any of you are Arabic speakers in here, anybody an Arabic speaker? Ah, yes, okay. So, uh, and he was in my class when we were talking about this. Uh, so he is from Sudan. Yes, and so he is multilingual, but one of his linguals is, is Arabic. And uh, the Arabic language does not have uh, a lot of vowels. It has, it, it's like consonants, and, and so you don't get a whole word. You have to read the context. So if um, the example they give is if you saw a sentence that was STMP, the BG, uh, you're not sure what that, what that says. If you're talking about uh, extermination, it might be stomp on the bug. But if you're talking about the postal service, it might be stamps are in the bag. Uh, so you have to read the context. And that's why the right brain has to, has to read those languages. They're more contextual. And so that's why they go from right to left. Uh, and then where do babies come in? It said, and, I, and I, I always thought that this depended on whether you were right-handed or left-handed, but they said almost all people who hold babies, who carry babies, carry them in their left arm. And uh, not all, Victoria, not 100%, <laughs> there was almost was in there, but uh, the vast majority, whether they, they said whether people are right-handed or left-handed, they carry babies in their left hand. And they said, and it's because your left, your left brain is the one that reads their emotions. 
And they've done lots and lots of studies where they have shown people faces with uh, different kinds of emotions, anger, surprise, uh, sadness, and when you're looking at those kinds of emotions, uh, the right brain fires up and they're reading and responding to those emotions. Uh, the left brain doesn't do anything with that because it, it, it doesn't care. Uh, and another thing that it, oh, uh, this is later in the presentation, so we'll wait. But I thought both of those things were, all, were, were just really fascinating. Okay. Occupations that have to do with the left brain or the right brain. Uh, and all of you kind of know this. It's the, uh, and they call it left directed thinking. Engineers, accountants, uh, programmers, analysts, they also initially listed lawyers in this. But it depends on what kind of a lawyer you are. If you're a lawyer who deals with documents, you're going to be left directed. If you're a lawyer who passionately argues in front of a, a jury, you're going to be more right-brained. And, and so, um, so there is that difference. And then uh, the right-directed thinking, inventors, counselors, people who are nurturers, people who um, react emotionally to things, uh, artists, entertainers, all of those are uh, more dominant, dominated by the right brain. And, um, and he said, historically, uh, in the 18th century, we were in the agricultural age, uh, people were farmers. In the 19th century, we obviously moved into the industrial age, people had jobs that were factory workers. In the 20th century, we've been in the information age. And the information age has been ruled by a lot of you who are in this room. It's been ruled by knowledge workers. It's been ruled by uh, technical people, programmers, analysts, uh, those kinds of people. Uh, and we see those jobs changing. And what he says, what his prediction is, that the 21st century uh, is going to be the conceptual age. And uh, it doesn't mean that you're, you're going to you're going to uh, not use your left brain, but everybody's got to beef up their right brain, that that is the one, the combination of the two, where you can think the way Gordon did. You, you analyze the problem, and you creatively come up with a solution. And so uh, lots of people can do the one side but not the other. And, and that we have to become more creative, more entrepreneurial, more inventive. And that means that for some of us, we have to do exercises to, uh, to beef up that, that part of the brain. And why are the jobs going away? The jobs are going away for three reasons. Uh, abundance, Asia, and automation. And, um, oh, so now my notes have appeared. Um, so abundance. Uh, we have lots and lots of lots and lots of things. Uh, and so what's going to, you know, you go, you go to buy, I don't know, you go to buy anything, and there are, you know, 50 different models, 50 different uh, kinds of things. You can, we have so much of stuff, so many things. What's going to differentiate one from another? Why are you going to buy this toilet brush instead of that toilet brush? Well, it's going to be because of design. It's going to be because one's prettier. And who knew that better than anybody else but Steve Jobs? And he came up with, with phones and consumer goods and uh, iPads and things like that that were designed beautifully, thinner and thinner, uh, you know, more and more um, design elements that differentiate this product from that product. It's, sometimes it's a very small uh, differentiation, like the plug on the, on the, on the blender. Uh, I can't get over how, how, how struck she was by that. So we have an abundance. And then um, Asia, this will be no surprise, it says, um, 
has a little picture of four people. It says, here are four people I met while researching this book. And they're going to be very much like all of you. They are the very embodiment of the knowledge worker ethic I described at the outset of this chapter. Like many bright middle class kids, they followed their parents' advice. Uh, they did well in high school. Uh, they went on to earn either an engineering or computer science degree from a good university. How many of you are in that category? Let me see. Okay, probably half, although some of you might just not have wanted to raise your hand. I don't know. Uh, they did well in high school, went on to earn either an engineering or computer science degree from a good university. They now work at a large software company helping to write computer code for North American banks and airlines. For their high-tech work, none of these four people earns more than about $15,000 a year. Wow. Why is that? Because they're all working in India. And so the, the knowledge worker jobs in the United States have, uh, many of them have gone off to these other countries. They're not here as much. 48% uh, of GE software is produced in India. Uh, they have 20,000 people employed in one city, and they have a sign on the door that says, trespassers will be recruited. They cannot get enough talented people to hire over there, not over here. Uh, there's a British company called Applegenics that created software that can write software. Uh, whereas a typical human programmer can write about 400 lines of code per day. Uh, Applegenics applications can do the same work in less than a second. Less than a second. And so it's not going to be complex code, but lots of people don't need complex code. Lots of companies need simple code. They need code that, you know, does routine tasks. And why hire somebody and have them work for a longer period of time at a big salary when you can get the software that can write the software? and save you all that money. Uh, so, uh, so it's tough. So in order to survive professionally, uh, you have to ask yourself these questions. Can someone overseas do this job more cheaply? Can a computer do it faster? Or is what I'm offering in demand in an age of abundance? So those are the three, not, not enemies necessarily, but conditions that you have to constantly be aware of. Okay? They just talked about how uh, it used to be that, that uh, you might go to a uh, a store and and you only had access to certain things now you have access to things from I mean like even groceries you know uh, you don't have to buy things in season because you have you have fruits and vegetables that are available that are brought in uh, look at Whole Foods it's almost obscene how, how much you know stuff is out there that we have access to they talked about uh, a store where you could buy uh, designer clothes and uh, not in a in a boutique uh, in Target uh, they've hired designers who've had who designed a whole you know and you've got um, designers in lots of in Kmart there's designer lines of things there's so many choices there's so many options so it's like uh, you know, how can you make yourself marketable in a place where there is, there's so much stuff? How are you going to differentiate your stuff from other people's stuff? And so in an age of abundance, how do you make yourself uh, stand out? How do you make your product stand out? So what Gordon said was, uh, it's supply and demand. If you're selling something where there's not much of it, you can charge a lot of money. Uh, but if you're selling something where it's out there, it's everywhere. It's everywhere and it's accessible and you can get it off the internet, you can get it uh, from stores, you can get it. Uh, then uh, it becomes cheaper and cheaper, easier to get. So then, uh, you know, you, you come up with a great idea for a good mousetrap 
and all of a sudden that idea has, has immediately become obsolete because there's a better mousetrap. And it's, and it's like uh, things have to continually uh, you know, be, be improved uh, in, order to, in order to be in demand. So uh, what is a body to do? It's very, it, it, you know, when you're on this end of that prop, that dilemma, pretty scary. And so what, um, so remain calm, uh, breathe deeply. <laughs> Don't remove your left brain. You, you'll need that. But increase, what, what, what uh, Daniel Pink says we, we should all do is increase six uh, right brain directed thinking skills. One of them is design, one empathy, story, play, symphony, and meaning. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about each one of these as, as long as we can. I'm afraid to click twice because then it'll, I'm afraid it'll move to the next one. But I'm going to... I did it? Oh, shame on me. Why did I do that? I'm clicking again. Okay. So design. Um, <clears throat> we assume all products... Oh, this was, this was a quote from, from Sony. And they said, uh, we assume all products of our competitors have the same technology, price, performance, and features. Design is the only differentiator. And that comes back to the Steve Jobs things as well. So it's, it's like we've got to figure out how to make it prettier, uh, you know, more functional, more, uh, more um, uh, UC UX, more usable, the usability factor. So we have a few uh, UX engineers in here who are all about usability, usability of websites, usability of uh, um, pill capsules, all that sort of stuff, uh, pill bottles. Uh, Cultivate a design sensibility. Design is an aptitude that is difficult to outsource or to automate. And so it, we need to think of not only function, but also form. We need to think of not only substance, but also style. So when you're thinking of things, always incorporate the design. See if you can think about things, not just in terms of will it do, do uh, what we need it to do, but will it do what we need it to do with some style? Uh, will it do it beautifully? Uh, is there a design element that we can incorporate that will make it, because that's something that a computer can't do. That's something that, that a person uh, in Asia probably will not be able to do, perhaps, as well as somebody here. So we're constantly thinking of how can we come up with something that we can do, another additional value added that will be something that, that we can do here that they won't do there better. Better, faster, quicker, cheaper. Um, in terms of, oh, and one of the things they talked about too that, from the book was a, a charter school, an experimental high school in somewhere like Pittsburgh or something. The kids that are in this high school are all very poor. It's a gang ridden area. Uh, something like 30% of them graduate, and they have turned it into a school of, of design. The acronym is CHAD, and I can't remember even what it is, what that stands for. There are architectural elements to this, and they will, uh, for example, when they uh, studied Roman architecture, the kids built, uh, using drafting and math, uh, built an aqueduct. Uh, and so they, they've incorporated all of the, this is, this is kind of common core as well, those of you who have studied a little bit about the common core that they're trying to get to be utilized throughout the country, uh, where you, you um, integrate all of the different study disciplines into a project, which makes the whole thing more fun and more hands-on. And now it looks as though 80% of those kids are not only going to graduate, but they're going to go on to at least a two-year college. And it's just a, an incredible success story. Uh, but they have incorporated design into, into that. Uh, in terms of the story, I'm going to sort of zip through these these uh, six categories, so you'll get a feel for them. Uh, lots of companies have realized that the, the stories about 
how they've solved problems. The stories that are shared at the at the water cooler are the it, it's like the the institutional memory that that helps people succeed. And so the stories of a company, not only the story of their mission that drives them, but the stories of how they solved problems and how they how they they succeeded, uh, is is the the core element that that needs to be retained. Uh, 3M, NASA, Xerox, Hewlett Packard, World Bank, all include storytelling in their executive management training. In some places, Xerox, they they said that they have just talked to all of their service people and gotten their stories about how they solved service problems, and they've compiled these stories in a in, instead of a manual a, 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 that is difficult to read and, and tedious and boring they've got the stories uh, cross-referenced and uh, the stories of how they solve this problem or that problem so they've done that uh, stories are often on websites stories are in mission statements uh, so that it's it, it um, it creates a picture in your mind. That's the beauty of a story. Uh, it's not just the facts. Your, your right brain kicks in and you visualize all of this happening and, it, and it, you're able to retain it more, uh, more clearly. Storytelling has become a business differentiator. And I'll read you a, an example of that. So uh, Daniel said, and all of you have gotten this as well, he says, uh, my family's neighborhood uh, in Northwest DC is in the midst of a slow generational turnover. The people who bought their houses decades ago and raised their kids in tidy brick colonials have all started to retire and young couples with children want to move in and so forth and so on. And so to entice a few more of the older folks to get up and go, realtors frequently send postcards to every address in the neighborhood touting the latest sky high price that they've gotten for one of these modest homes. And we've all gotten those. Hey, a house in your neighborhood has just sold for this amount of money. And it's like, whoa. And as he said, it's usually uh, followed by a number of exclamation points. And so he got, he got two of those uh, sort of things in the mail. And one of them was that. And he immediately th threw it away. And he was about to throw out the second one. And then he, he started to read it because it was different. And it said, here's what it said. Florence Skretowitz and her husband bought this delightful home in 1955. They paid $20,000 in cash for it and loved the many special details like solid oak floors, large windows, including many with leaded glass, oak millwork around the doors, an old English fireplace mantle, and a garden pond. At age 91, Florence moved to Brighton Gardens, a retirement community in Friendship Heights, and the Fernandez sisters, neighbors and old family friends, asked me to sell this jewel. I was honored. Florence let us clear out the house, paint it inside and out, refinish the floors, and wash the windows. Now please take a minute to welcome Scott Dresser and Christy Constantine, the new residents who love the house just as much and plan to be in it forever and ever. It's a story. This postcard didn't mention the sale price of the home. That seemed like an oversight at first, but it was actually a deft bit of conceptual age marketing. The price the house sold for is easy to find in the newspaper, on the internet, and so forth. Besides, the houses here are similar enough that their selling prices don't vary all that much. Uh, but uh, this realtor distinguishes her services from her number happy competitors. How better to do it than with a story? Wouldn't you want to work with that realtor instead of uh, Mr. Dream Home? Just asking. So lots of companies now uh, work, they market themselves with a story. Uh, another one, you've probably all tasted the tea now I can't remember what it is. It 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 um, it's from Egypt, I guess, and and a portion of it goes to buy um, schools, hospitals. His mother was ailing and and didn't have the money, and so he sells this tea, and they give they sell it uh, extensively in in Whole Foods and Central Market, and you get the your little your little tea, and then you've got this story that when you buy the tea, you're helping, you know, build uh, the furnish hospitals in the villages. Uh, so how much better is that? So stories have become a huge marketing element. Symphony. Symphony uh, is, is 
means people can, can take disparate pieces and kind of put them together in unusual ways and come up with a, with a, a, a new concept. And, uh, and they synthesize rather than analyze. So the left side does the analysis and the right side does the synthesis. It puts together disparate things and comes up with a, with a, a big picture. Uh, and the ex perfect example of this was the Hershey's company that used to have the ad that had, had the one guy walking down the street eating a chocolate bar and the other guy walking down the street eating peanut butter and they have a big collision. And uh, this confectionery uh, fender bender results in Reese's peanut butter cups. And so you put together two seemingly disparate ideas. But that's the whole thing about, about symphony. And and people sometimes see that. The example that they gave was the guy that, that had a shaggy dog and he'd take him for a walk and he'd come back with burrs stuck in his fur. And that was the guy who invented Velcro. Right, and so, you know, all of, all of those kinds of things where you, you see something and it, it, it sparks an idea. Well, when you're going to get one of those ideas, guess what part of your brain fires up? the front right part of your brain. And it's like, oh my God, I just had a great idea. It's that part of your brain that fires up. And what's neat about this book, I'm gonna buy a bunch and give them out for um, door prizes, but uh, I don't suggest that, you know, uh, go to the library. All these books I'm sure are in the library. But at the end of each one of these six chapters, there are a list, a long list of activities, action items, things you can do. Uh, to spark your creativity. One of them, uh, so the design thing was one, one of them said, go to a newsstand, and I don't know that the numbers are, are important, but it said spend 20 minutes scoping out different kinds of magazines and then buy 10 of them that you would never nor normally buy. And just kind of go through them and see if you see something that uh, makes your brain, go, you know, explode. Uh, and he said, one of the things, and I can only remember one, one was that he was looking at a cake, cake decorating magazine and he came up with a great idea for his business cards on how to redesign his business cards. And, uh, and he came up with another one as well that I can't remember. And so what's ironic about that is Ken McElroy, leader of our uh, South Austin Clublet, uh, has brought, and he's, every week now he's bringing magazines, and they're magazines that lots of us would never have, um, have read. There's a, one about archeology, span there's, I can't remember what they all are, but different kinds of magazines, and he encourages people every week, take a magazine. And so I really want you to take a magazine, something that you would never have thought of before, and, and work this little exercise, see if, it, if your brain explodes. I'm so excited about that. Uh, so the, the aha moments, which we've all had, uh, the flashes of insight that precede, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I screwed that up, but the flashes of insight that precede the aha moment are accompanied by burst of neural activity in the Eureka Center. There is a center that they call the Eureka Center, and it happens right before you get one of those, and it's in the right brain. And when you're working out problems methodically, analyzing them, guess what's dormant? The Eureka Center because you're, you're using only the left side of your brain in those things. What? It needs a shower. Oh, that's why he thought it needs a Okay, so Pat said you need a shower. That doesn't mean that you need to get naked in order to have an aha moment, although sometimes that happens. But it means Archimedes, that's right. Archimedes was in the bath, wasn't he? And he had his eureka moment, and he, that's right, and he did run out on the street naked. Um, I don't encourage that. That's not, I'm not recommending that. Uh, but, but that's the whole point. And sometimes when you walk away from a problem, so you're thinking about it, you're analyzing it, you're being too methodical, and you walk away from it, and you do something else, and all of a sudden that's when the right brain kicks in, and it's like, yes, there's the solution. Uh, so there is that. There's lots and lots of, of cool things about, about the symphony 
section. That was one of my favorite ones. Uh, just one cognitive ability distinguished um, star performers from average. So there was a big study that was done with the executives from 15 different large companies. And all the tests they did, all the neural analysis that they did, one cognitive ability distinguished the star performers from the average performers, and it was pattern recognition. Pattern recognition happens only in the right brain. And it's, and it's where you, you see this and you apply it to that. You see a pattern. It's a metaphor. You see this and it's like, oh, that's a metaphor. It's just like that. Uh, how is, why is job hunting like looking for a spouse? Why is, um, you know, why is this like that? And, and the people that are completely right-brained and the most creative are very often, uh, you know, who thinks in terms of metaphors and similes? Poets. And one CEO said, uh, I don't want those people for managers. I want poets. I want people who think metaphorically. I want people who see that this can apply to that. Uh, and so anyway, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, another study revealed that that's, this was fascinating. Self-made millionaires are four times more likely to be dyslexic than the rest of the population. Charles Schwab, your new boss, dyslexic. Uh, and uh, Richard Branson, dyslexic. And it's, it's just like any impairment when, when your brain doesn't work well in one part, it, it frequently becomes act, uh, super activated uh, in another part. And dyslexics are able because that left brain part where they, they don't do well with reading, they don't do well with language, they frequently struggle with, with, with math when it's written down like that. But boy, that right brain, uh, they, they think so creatively. And so as long as they can not be bothered by their inability to do this part, uh, they very often are incredibly creative with the other part. So they struggle with all the L-directed L thinking, but they excel at intuitive problem solving and in seeing the big picture. They don't get bogged down with the details. Uh, the next one was empathy. And when you think about it, uh, empathy is something that only humans can do. They've been trying to make robots that were empathetic, uh, to, who could be caregivers in a nursing home, for example. They wanted robots who would treat Ebola people. They could come, they could do certain things, they could bring them food. They can't say, don't worry, honey, it's going to be okay. They can't do it. Uh, the one aptitude that's proven impossible for computers to reproduce and very difficult for faraway workers to match because we relate to each other differently in different countries is empathy. And then they had a great thing about the fake smile. And so, um, and, it, and Daniel Pink has taken two pictures. This is so cool. Uh, in both the fake smile and the real smile, uh, the muscles in your face, you have 43 muscles in your face that control facial movement. In the fake smile and the real smile, the muscles that make your mouth go up, they're both working, right? Fake smile. Let me take your picture. Let me see all your fake smiles. All right. But what makes a real smile is the muscles that are in your eyes. And uh, your eyes get a little bit smaller. The space between your eyebrow and your eyes gets smaller. Uh, they, they, they get a little crinklier. And so uh, sometimes you can, if you, if you look at people who are smiling, if you cover up, cover up the lower part of the face, it, it's all about the eyes. You can tell totally if somebody's really smiling or they're not smiling by what happens up here. Think about that. Okay. Uh, and... Let me think about that. Oh, they said uh, lots and lots of studies have, have shown that in general, there are, there are certainly males that are empathetic and there are females who are not empathetic, but overall, uh, females tend to, to rate much more high, highly on the, on the empathy scale than men and wherever that comes from. And, but you need to be somewhat androgynous. The example that they gave about empathy, this was, this was so inter interesting. This was back with the anthrax scare. Uh, and there was a post office that th they suspected that anthrax had you know, been sent in a, 
in a letter, we, we may all remember this, that had gone, that had been processed through that post office. And there was a man, there, a man went to a male doctor and said, um, I'm feeling sick. And and he mentioned, and by the way, I work for the post office, and there, we've had a, a bit of an anthrax scare. And the doctor said, um, "Well, I think it might be it might be uh, this. Um, take this kind of medicine and go home." And the guy died of anthrax. Uh, another person, same post office, went to a female doctor, and same symptoms, and mentioned that that he worked for that post office. And she said, well, it does, you don't seem to have the symptoms for it, but let's give you that medicine just in case. And, uh, and we'll give it to you. We'll run some tests. Uh, let's follow up with this. And um, there was another thing she did that I can't remember. And, and as it turns out, he did test positive for anthrax, and he lived. And, and they said she was the one that listened uh, she was the one that trusted him, that paid attention to him, and because of that, there now are classes in medical schools all over the place on empathy, on pay, you know, pay attention to what they say, pay attention to how they feel, uh, go that extra mile. But it was a, it, that's why they said some androgyny, you can't just be empathetic, you have to be empathetic and then also have the, the detachment to not uh, get too involved, but to do the, do the job that you need to do. And then the next one was play. And two weeks ago, we had a fabulous presentation by Jeff Johannigman, uh, who is one of the most playful, fun-loving, creative people, definitely works with his entire brain. I mentioned that you should, if you don't, if you don't start going to the meetings of Austin Geeks and Gamers, you should at least look at their website, because Jeff is there dressed up in costume, and just when he says, these are the people that would love this, this meetup group, and it sounds like, you know, it's, it's the comic book people, and it's the folks who... Uh, who uh, play Dungeons and Dragons, and it's the people that that do the whole fantasy thing and so forth. It just sounds as though if you're not that kind of person, we want to be that kind of person because it sounds like so much fun. So Austin Geeks and Gamers, empathy, androgyny. All right. So play obviously uses the right brain, and uh, and the more fun you're having, and the most light, more lighthearted you are, and the most childlike you are, the more you're using your right brain. Uh, it is a business differentiator, and, and just think about Southwest Airlines. Uh, their mission it says people rarely succeed at anything unless they're having fun doing it, and they encourage people to be goofy. They encourage people. Uh, uh, so I went on Southwest, and uh, there's safety, there's yeah, there's safety talks are hysterical. You can go on on YouTube and just do Southwest Airlines uh, flight attendant talks, and and you'll just roll with laughter. They're they're so hilarious. Our guy said, if you have any complaints about our service, the exits are there's two here, there's two here, and there's two here. Uh, one time I went on a Southwest, and she said, I'd like to welcome you to Honolulu. Unfortunately, we're in Portland, but I'd like to welcome you to Honolulu. I mean, they're just you know, uh, there's so much fun. <clears throat> so. Uh, it, they talked about Ford Motor Company in the 30s and 40s, and guess what? If you laughed, you're fired. Uh, if you smile, if you tell a joke, you're put in disciplinary probation. Uh, and Henry Ford said, you're either at work or you're, you're at play. Uh, we don't mix those up. And, uh, and today, the more levity, the more joking, the more fun you can have. Look at MASH. The worse the conditions, the more you have to laugh. The, the, the more it lightens it up and enables you to, to, to continue and move forward. Play is huge, and it has become a, a major reason that somebody will go to one company and work instead of another company to work. Uh, video games. Daniel Pink says, if you are not a video gamer, you have got to become a video gamer. It's just, it's, it's helpful in so many ways, not only for, uh, uh, to sort of remove yourself from the stresses of where you are, but there, it's, it's so good in, in so many ways. My, one of my sons is a director at a semiconductor fab, and six of his engineers have quit. 
And so he's doing his job and three of their jobs and uh, usually handles stress really well. But uh, I know that he plays video games two or three hours a night. And, uh, and it's, a, it, it's also something that makes us all smarter. Uh, the Army was having difficulty recruiting anybody. And, and uh, they decided to tap into, some guy had an aha moment, right brain clicked off, and he said, let's create a video game. They like these war games. Let's create a video game called American Army. And uh, they did, and it, it, it doesn't st stress so much the killing, although you do get points for kills, but it stresses teamwork. You get points for if your whole team comes back alive. Uh, it's problem solving, it's collaboration, uh, and you get points for all of those different things. But it's a video game. And, uh, and they put it out there, and the first month, maybe, 200 million, pe no, 2 million people or were playing American Army. It's free. If they had charged, they would have made $600 million the first year on American Army. And it has had, it's been very, very popular. Uh, they did a survey of college students trying to f figure out what leisure activities do they all do. And they, they talked about movies. How many of you have seen this movie? How many of you have seen Star Wars? How many of you have seen Casablanca? To try to, is there a common um, history? The only thing, 100%, have you played a video game? 100%. Physicians who spent at least three hours a week playing video games made 37% fewer mistakes in laparoscopic surgery, and they performed the task 27% faster than their counterparts because their eye-hand coordination has become so great. How many of us have marveled at little kids who are on their computers and their, their fingers are just flying? And the other thing about, about video games, video games teach how to think deeply about complex systems. Is that up there? Yes. Um, where everything interacts in complicated ways. My grandchildren are constantly saying, watch me play this game, and I can't keep track of it. Things are happening, things are attacking. Uh, they, see, they see everything going on at once. And that's the whole big picture thing. The right brain is there, the eye-hand coordination is there, the, the instant analysis of what do I need to do, uh, the fact that disasters will happen if I don't, if I don't move here and use this uh, resource and, and uh, go over to that thing. They have to see it all, and their brains are just firing 100%. The left and the right, they're both going like crazy. And we need to not just be voyeurs of that process. We need to be doing it too. And there's tons of free games that you don't have to, you know, spend 10 hours a day on it. But get to where you're starting to think, think like that. You know, what are the mind games that you can play and where you have to use the left brain and the right brain. Uh, Carnegie Mellon has started a new master's degree program uh, where you can get a master's in entertainment technology that includes game design, it includes um, it, the whole video thing, the, the movie industry and all of that stuff. It's programs that combine left brain and right brain uh, opportunities. Did you have a, a comment? And it said, so she said she just heard that UT is, is giving some sort of a certification for video gaming, and lots of places are, that, where that's becoming a, a part of their core curriculum. And one of the things they said, which was a little strange to me, they said the programming piece is being outsourced. But what they're hiring is the art people, the characterization people, uh, the storyboard people. That's what they're hiring here. And they're outsourcing the programmer people. And even, um, I have a friend who um, uh, is in the, it, he works for Disney. And the background, all of that animation uh, was outsourced to China. And that's where the color, the, the color stuff is so good in China. Everybody sends all that to China. But there are certain elements that they, that they do here. Uh, the next one is, is play. Uh, the next part of play is just humor. And I just thought this was a great quote. 
because we don't always think of our comedians as being some of the most intelligent people on the planet, but humor represents one of the highest forms of human intelligence, whether, and whether we get it, whether we get the joke, it depends on the right brain. And when they've, they've um, analyzed people who've had a stroke where their right brain is impaired, and they, they give them a, um, a key line, you know, a, a priest, a rabbi, and a so-and-so walk into a bar, and then they give them four possible punch lines, uh, if the right brain is impaired, they don't, they don't get it. Sometimes they'll choose the slapstick version, which they said was one reason why the Three Stooges is more popular with males than with females. <laughs> it's so funny. And I guess you all got it. Okay. <laughs> said the man. Okay, and then, and then the last piece was, uh-huh, yeah. Okay, and Victoria has taken improv, and I guess Pat has too. So she said if anybody wants to kind of practice that uh, humor uh, improv class, uh, it's, it's cheap and it's, and it's great fun. Victoria? One of the things they talked about was that the SAT, the PSAT, the ACT, all of those tests that we all grew up with, uh, they're left brain tests. And that some people have come up with right brain tests or a combination of the two. And uh, there's a number of different uh, components to it. But one component is they show them three um, New Yorker cartoons and they tell them to come up with a caption. Uh, and, and so, and I, I got. I found in my mama's house uh, a book of New Yorker cartoons, and so I'm going to make some copies next time and pass them out, and you guys can all practice. But, uh, but that sort of thing, you know, where, where, you, where you try to figure out humor. <clears throat> and, and the managers, the executives who have a great sense of humor, their businesses do better. I'm just saying. Their stock goes better. Uh, and, and so the last uh, attribute uh, is the one that, that I, I really don't have time to go into it a whole lot, but it was, it was about meaning. It was about uh, when it comes down to it, uh, people want to do something uh, where they feel they're making a difference. I remember one time during the dot-com bust and right after 9-11, I had somebody who said, you know, my next job, I don't want to just help a, a semiconductor company make another million dollars. I want to do something uh, that helps people. And, and he went, for a while at least, into the, private sec the public sector, and he worked for a state agency. And so uh, the, uh, Victor Frankl, who was a, a famous uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, after he, he was the only person in his family who survived the concentration camps, and he had, he had written a book of his philosophy, and his wife, Tilly, had sewn it inside a jacket, hoping to save this manuscript. And, uh, and they, took all of, they took the jacket, and so he lost it when he went into Auschwitz. And, and he, he scribbled on scraps of paper and smuggled out scraps of paper from the concentration camps. Everybody else in his family was killed. And, and he lived, and he said the most important thing is... Um, uh, that what we all work for is, does my life have meaning? Uh, have I done something that's worthwhile? And that was the core of his, of his entire philosophy. And one of the uh, action items, one of the homework assignments for meaning uh, was take the, t the 2010 test. If you had $20 million in the bank or if you knew you had only 10 years to live, would you be doing the same work that you're doing now or would you not? Would you be getting into a different career field? And if you say no, there's no way in the world that I would be doing this job, uh, that should, that should um, say something to you that you might want to take action on. And that's kind of where Vic Victoria is. She's trying to leave the world of that has no meaning and she wants to uh, get a job that has meaning. However, at this point, 
uh, survival uh, is kind of superseding that a little bit. So she can always do what Holly did. Holly took a survival job at, at um, uh, LBB, Legislative Biz, um, Budget Board, and, but at the same time, she's looking for the job that she really wants, the job that's going to that's gonna pay off. And, and it's, you know, that's that old Maslow hierarchy thing. You've got to have a shelter, you've got to have food, you've got you to feel safe, and then work on those higher levels. But the meaning thing, uh, important. Don't give it up. It, the spiritual part, oh, the, yeah, the spiritual part is a right brain feature. And they talked about, and, and he was really trying to walk a fine line because he didn't want to, you know, promote religion so much. But they, um, like people who are uh, in the hospital, uh, they do a survey about uh, do you have uh, a spiritual uh, side are you do you feel that you are spiritual do you do you believe in in a higher power all of that stuff people tend to heal faster uh, if they have that connection that cosmic connection to something greater than them, uh, than themselves the the whole that whole meaning thing do I matter do I matter am I important uh, do I matter in the universe and that if you have that connection that that lives in your right brain and that it can um, it can make make your work and your environment more significant. Uh huh, Victoria. And meaning is also related to these other things that we talked about earlier in terms of being able to think simultaneously, being able to think big picture, being able to see connections, the interconnections, the 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 story, the message of the play. Meaning meaning is kind of embedded in, in pattern recognition. We are. Exactly, and that whole that whole mythic thing, the Joseph Campbell thing about about the the common elements of of religion and myth and story and the things that that help us see meaning in in the world around us, all of that lives in the right brain. So it's a fascinating book, and I hope that you'll you'll try to get it and read it, and I hope that you'll do some of the exercises that are recommended just because they're, they sound like fun and they sound really interesting to help you see yourself and your world in a different way.